بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering, to shower upon us with his mercy, to reward you all for tuning in, for joining. Jazakumullahu khaira, barakallah fikum, jumu'a mubarakah to you all. Alhamdulillah, today is a blessed day and also a blessed night. We have beautiful dear imams that will be joining this panel insha'Allah and we'll be bringing barakah to this discussion may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and, and preserve them and jazakumullah khair all for coming and joining for tuning in and coming together as a community and uh, subhanallah brothers and sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran wa'tasimu bihablillahi jami'a where he reminds you and I to hold on to his rope, to come together as a unified body. We discuss these issues, we address people's concerns, and inshallah, we try our best to address uh, our illnesses and how to overcome them as an ummah. Uh, alhamdulillah, we have our dear mashayikh and imams that are joining. I will add each one to the screen. I don't want to be on the screen alone. just want to add our... Dear Imams, insha'Allah. Um, Bismillah. I'm going to add uh, our dear Sheikh Muhammad Baqir Qazwini. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. It's a great honor to be with you this evening to participate in this wonderful panel. Jazakumullah khair. MashaAllah. Ahlan wa sahlan. It's so beautiful to see you. Likewise, may Allah bless you and your efforts. Ameen, ameen. I will also add Imam uh, Salim Khalid, insha'Allah. Imam Salim, assalamu alaikum. I think he's on mute. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah. How are you, Imam Salim? How are you, Shaykh? Alhamdulillah. You're looking younger every time I see you, Imam Salim. You must be talking to Sheikh Kazwini. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Good to see you all in Jumu'a Mubarakah. Inshallah, Ya Rabbi Allah, Ya'allah minhum. May Allah make us among them. Ya Allah. How's everything? Uh, Sheikh Kazwini, how's your community? How's everyone? How's your family? Alhamdulillah, everyone's well. Slowly, we have resumed some of the programs in person. With the guidelines, of course. So, Alhamdulillah, it's good to see our community after many, many months. Inshallah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. How about you, Imam Salim? You staying safe? You're healthy? Everything is good. The family is well. We thank Allah SWT. Alhamdulillah. May Allah, may Allah continue to give you the energy. You know, and just to allow you to serve Imam Salim, you're, 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 you've been serving the community for so long. May Allah protect you and put barakah and your health and wealth and allow you to serve more and more, inshallah. And, and also, Sheikh Khazwini, for you, the same. May Allah bless you and your family, your parents. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward, reward your parents for, for giving us people uh, like yourself to serve the community. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you for your kind words. I appreciate your wonderful du'as. And the same for you and your family and Imam uh, Salim and all the other Imams that will be with us on the panel this evening. Inshallah. Inshallah, we have Imam Mikail uh, joining soon. And we will also have Imam Dawood Walid, inshallah. Uh, so inshallah, if we could uh, begin our program, bi'idhnillah. If our Imams are okay with that, if we can start, inshallah. So, Bismillah. As we mentioned earlier, brothers and sisters, the objective of this beautiful panel and this beautiful discussion is to table this issue and to address it uh, as a community and to allow our imams to share their perspectives and to shine uh, onto us the shara'i perspective. Uh, of racism and challenges that we may be dealing with 
as communities. And this is our religious duty and obligation to overcome such illnesses. Subhanallah, my dear Mashaykh, what makes this very important is that such illness, like racism and, 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 and other illnesses are hidden illnesses. It's like the shirk al azgha And what's dangerous about that is that it's not noticeable, cannot be identified, cannot be diagnosed very easily. It takes time until it occupies the heart. Once it occupies the heart, it becomes very difficult to overcome that illness. And shaitan is one of the greatest examples. That kibr and racism, arrogance and racism was rooted in his heart and it took over his heart to the extent where he was prepared to reject. He was willingly um, uh, and, and easily rejecting the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though he was close to Allah, even though he was knowledgeable. So it shows you that ilm may not go far enough if one does not embody that which they learn. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that our ummah bi idnillah uh, consider themselves as, as role models, people that take on this responsibility by addressing these illnesses and trying to overcome them, inshallah, where we have communities that are free from racism, from bigotry, from hatred. The issue, subhanAllah, that, that or one of the challenges that we find that we still have people use certain words, um, say or use a language that may be disrespectful, insulting to others, knowing that we have a manhaj, we have a Quran, we have a sunnah, we have ulama, that, that we're able to demonstrate prophetic guidance. And, we, and, and this is all rooted in our tradition and we may um, still be uh, neglectful and living in neg uh, negligence. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to purify our hearts and to go straight into our heart and addressing these illnesses. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify our hearts and allow us to overcome such illnesses. Ameen, Allahumma ameen. This is done by the Imam's council. Again, the Imams, inshallah, will also start the discussion. But Jazakumullah khair, Imams, again, we're, um, we're, we're, we're honored that you're joining. Uh, since um, that was just the introduction, if I can begin with uh, Imam Salim, insha'Allah, to address his part, insha'Allah, will be that will be good. Imam, Imam. Yes. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Tonight, for the purposes of our discussion this evening. Uh, the initial role that I'm going to play is just touching on the uh, subject of asabiya. Uh, and let me begin with uh, literally uh, a simple uh, definition or an explanation of what asabiya means. Its definition, not linguistically, but idiomatically. Uh, asabiya would be an individual support, a man or a woman supporting a people to whom they feel they belong, whether those people are right or wrong. And the belonging to these people can be due to relationship, that's kith and kin, family members. It can be ethnicity. It can be something as uh, weak as a social construct, uh, such as color or race, birthplace, citizenship, or a group of people who have a common interest. Uh, tonight, as we talk about Asabiya, we're talking about the issue of race. Uh, let me share with you, a man once, it's, it's written that a man once asked our beloved prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, O messenger of Allah, is it tribalism or Asabiya if a man loves people? The prophet Wasallam said, no, rather from the characteristics of tribalism is when a man helps his people in wrongdoing. So love for one's people is normal and healthy in the right context. Affiliation with a tribe, your lineage, a group, or a nation as a way of introducing one another or one to another and cooperating in certain matters and not for the purpose of boasting and fighting each other is something permissible. 
In fact, it's a part of nature that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has instilled in mankind and allows them to promote. But love that comes at the expense of justice is not commendable. The Prophet, may the peace and blessings of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala be upon him, clarified that what defines asabiya is oppression and injustice for the sake of one's own group. Keep in mind also that part of oppression is thinking badly of people and looking down on them the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned us about. Um, as for its ruling, this issue uh, of, of for us as believers, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in a translation of the Quran in the 49th chapter, the believers are nothing else other than brothers in Islamic religion. In other words, we're brothers and sisters to one another. And then our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O slaves of Allah, be brothers to one another. So being prejudiced to an ethnic background or again, a supposed race is a call to the pre-Islamic era of ignorance. And the Prophet may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon him said, whoever calls to a practice of the pre-Islamic era of ignorance, jahiliya, and we'll talk about jahiliya tonight, will be among the denizens of hellfire. So a man asked again, O Prophet of Allah, even if he performs the prayers and the fast, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, even if he performs the prayers and fast, so call to the call of Allah who named you Muslims, believers, O slaves of Allah. Now let's just touch for a minute. And again, we're gonna get into the substance of this in our discussion. I don't wanna take up too much time at the onset, but let's just talk for a minute. What causes asibiya? The drive that causes asibiya is the feeling of being better than others and that others are of a lower class. So what an individual does, they've elevated themselves in rank and they've lowered people who are outside of their group. So the person that has this feeling thinks highly of himself and of those from the group that he belongs. And he thinks or she thinks that other people are not as good as his own people. This kind of thinking is corrupted and it is in fact a kind of arrogance as uh, our beloved Imam El Masmuri made reference earlier. It's an arrogance that comes from the mentality of Iblis, which led him to disobey the command of Allah when he ordered him to prostrate to Adam. And you all know that story. Asibia takes on a number of forms and it's harmful in many ways. It undermines the concept of Ummah, changing what should be unity and harmony to disunity and conflict. And there are different kinds of asibia, but tonight, again, we're talking about racism. So I think with that, uh, if in fact um, it's okay, Imam El Masmuri, I'll end and we'll pick up further into the conversation. I see our, the face of our young Imam, uh, Imam Mikael. Good to see him. And uh, let's, inshallah, Imam Daoud. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's great sorry for the delay. I was wrapping up a program with the MSA in New York. Mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Well, it's, it's no problem. I was a little late also. I, I was expressing that to the group. I had an emergency. But alhamdulillah, we all are here. A'udhu billahi min shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa ansari wa ajma'in. Ameen amma ba'd. So um, I don't think that uh, we really got off into our uh, objectives yet, but just to our viewers and to uh, everyone that's participating, we want to say jazakum al khaira. We want to uh, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course. We want to thank our imams and our scholars and all of you who are viewing, because this is a very important topic that the imams felt that we had to address in a unified body. So. Just to give you some uh, context, the imams we've met several times, at least three times, special meetings. We formed a special committee with African-American imams, and we also presented to the whole body of imams. And it was decided through the imams group that we would bring forward to the community a critical webinar to address our concerns. 
the objectives for this evening's program, and, and uh, Imam Salim eloquently expressed some of them about al uh were one of the talking points of al but the objectives are to address racism and the rise of public displays of hate in our nation, to discuss the roots of racism and the effects of racism on our faith, to ultimately prove that racism is a sin and can be considered an act of disbelief. So without any further delay, uh, we want to allow Imam Azwini to, uh, well, Imam Dawood is here. So we actually, uh, I think we were going in the, the order. Imam Salim uh, went first, Imam Dawood went. So after um, uh, Imam Dawood, Imam Azwini will begin. I did want to read the bios, but uh, a lot of our guests here, you know already. And if you all want, you can tell our audience a little bit about yourselves for the communities that may not be familiar with you. So I yield to Imam uh, Dawood Walid, who will be talking about Jahiliya. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa aftalu salati wa atimu taslim, ala seyyidina wa nabiyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi al-tahirin, wa bridwana Allahi ta'ala, ala sahabati al-rashidin, wa tabi'in lahum bi khayran wa isanin ila yawm al-deen, wa alina ma'ahum bil-rahmatika ya ahmur rahimeen. First of all, um, it's uh, a pleasure to be uh, on here with you uh, fellow imams as we discuss this uh, very pertinent and timely issue, and especially since we have people marching on the streets all throughout the United States of America in the wake of the verdict of uh, Breonna Taylor in that particular situation. That is one of many cases uh, in which we see um, varying expressions of racism in our society uh, and in this particular case, as it relates to the judiciary uh, system. Uh, I was tasked to talk about Jahiliya. I'm gonna keep my comments very short. Uh, we know that the term uh, El, uh, El Jahiliya or Astro Jahiliya uh, explicitly relates to the era of ignorance that predates the Quran being revealed to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Ali. So this is how we understand uh, this term, and we know that this term, El Jahiliya, relates to the word Jahil or ignorance. And a, in singular, a, an ignoramus would be a Jahil. Uh, so these are all related. Uh, as it relates to this issue of racism, uh, there's two different types of ignorance, we are told in our Islamic texts. We have uh, jahl basit and we have jahl murakab, right? We have two, we have simple ignorance. And <clears throat> when someone doesn't know something and they know they don't know, right? This can be more easily corrected because once they come in contact with proper or sound information and if they have an open heart, they have an open chest, then they can incline from that and learn and help them change their behavior which I will give an example of that. But then we also have jahl murakab, which is complex or compounded ignorance, when not only the person doesn't know, but they think that they know best, and then they double down and act upon that ignorance. And we can say that an archetype of jahl murakab was Abu Jahl, the, the Fir'aun of our prophet, uh, peace be upon him, right? So these these are these are examples. Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib, karamallahu ta'ala wajahu radiallahu an, he has a famous saying that's been narrated in many books, both of of, of, of Ahlul Sunnah as well as Ahlul Tashayru, where he said, reportedly, and nas a'da'uma jahilu. People are enemies or adversaries of what they're ignorant of. Right, and if we look at the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salam, li kulli da'in du'a, for every disease is a cure. So this, this saying of Amir al-Mu'mineen is basically talking about the issue of, of ignorance, but then we also know that there's the opposite of this ignorance as part of the cure, right? Which is knowledge and there's, uh, and we can go into that later about how we get this knowledge that can help us with racism. <coughs> But 
There is the just people simply not knowing and going off of unconscious bias and stereotypes about people because they don't know any better, right? And this can happen in, in many places. I just heard something disturbing relating uh, a class that I'm involved in with uh, with Dr. Bilal Ware and some other people, Sheikh Mohammed Mendes was talking about the contributions of Muslims in West Africa and Muslims who are black in America. And this one particular individual said, well, you know, um, you know, black people don't have any culture. Like, it's like, where did he get that from? You know, Muslims don't, Muslims who are black or West African, they don't have culture. Uh, this is a form of ignorance to make a statement like this. But this person had never been to West Africa. He doesn't socialize with people. And then he obviously hasn't read Ibn, Bat Rihla, uh, Ibn Battuta or Tariq al-Sudan or any of these other books that talk about the great histories of this ulama and civilizations in Mali, Mansa Musa, the Ghanaian Empire. He's, he doesn't know, but perhaps if he's given some information, then perhaps this could change his mind. This is just someone who doesn't know, right? <laughs> and made this statement. Then there's those who think they know and don't know anything. And then they act upon that arrogance, that this that arrogant mentality that they have. And this also relates to the issue of racism. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam said that this type of arrogance that is it, that is underlies this Jahl Muraqab, it, it does two things. He said, El Kibrul Batrul Haq. This is number one that this arrogance will make people reject the truth, right? Truth comes to them and then they'll just reject it. Well, then they'll seek to put down and, and undermine people, seek to put them down and marginalize them. And this is really the arrogance of the jahiliya that is embedded in racism, right? And this is how uh, the Arabs acted in Mecca towards the the people to, to some of the Sahaba who weren't Arab, like Bilal al Habashi and Salman al Farasi, and they experienced things and they were mistreated and called certain things, and even in Medina, when being called Yabna Sauda or you son of a black woman, and 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 attempts to try to belittle Salman because he wasn't Arab and things like this. So these aren't things, and the, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he dealt with this. And to remove uh, the jahil from the the Arabs, and it worked for for the uh, for the righteous and pious companions. Then there were others during his lifetime uh, who weren't righteous, who weren't pious, and those people who did not come to Islam. It didn't work for them. Uh, but I think I will stop uh, with that. There's much more that could be said. Uh, oh, I, I will mention one more thing because. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned that there were four characteristics of the Jahiliya amongst his Ummah, right? He mentioned there are four characteristics. And it relates to this issue because one is boasting about one's heritage or one's position, right? al fakr fil ahsab This is one. And the second is wa ta'nu and sab, right? That you put people down, or revile people because of their lineage. So both of these also are types of jahiliya that you see what people will do. Uh, uh, I'm this and I'm that, or I'm from the these people or this tribe. Oh, and my family has been Muslim for 1,400 years, and you just converted, oh, oh black guy, or or oh, oh uh, Latino or whatever. And I come from this lineage. I'm from Beni Tamim, and blah 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 blah. And, and you're this, you're Johnny come lately Muslim. Or, yeah, my lineage is this and this. And then, you know, and we have this particular color skin and this particular color look. And we were this and we were that. And then look at you. So this is part of the jahiliya that Islam came to do away with. But unfortunately, our prophet, peace be upon him, said that this would remain to an extent within his ummah. This is uh, a uh, authentic hadith in which he talks about this issue. And we ask Almighty Allah to grant us refuge from 
jahiliya and from being a most jahilin. Mm -hmm. Ahsantum. Imam Dawood, if I may add just one quick point mm -hmm. here. Uh, in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he mentions the jahiliya, he says, وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَى Ula. First era of ignorance. A number of exegetes and mufassirs of the Quran have concluded that don't think jahiliya is over just now because this religion has been revealed to you and you have the Quran and you have the teachings of the Prophet It will keep surfacing and there could be a second jahiliya and a third jahiliya. And so what you said is very relevant and we really have to safeguard ourselves from the Jahiliyyah that keeps surfacing time and time again. I mean, excellent, Imams. So we also want to give a context uh, to our, our discussion also with uh, the public because, you know, even though we're using uh, Arabic terms, religious terms, scholarly terms, it's very important that we synthesize these terms and make them digestible and really speak the common language of the people. So in, in context, in our faith, we believe that all people come from Adam, alayhi salam, which makes us all one race and brothers and sisters in humanity from one person. Allah Ta'ala proves his magnificence and allows people to manifest various physical traits or phenotypes, mainly because of environment and consistent reproduction among specific groups. It is only arrogance and ignorance that misleads people to believe that they or someone else is superior simply because they look different. So now we're going to have Imam Fazwini to address Fasuk. How is this a uh, sinful Imam in, in respect of our context of racism and bigotry? Thank you. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wal mursaleen. Muhammadin وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين uh, Respected Imams with, us, with me in this panel and all the viewers who have tuned in to this program this evening I greet you with the greeting of Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh When we examine the word fusuq we find that the Holy Quran makes a number of references to this word for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one very striking verse states, وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Know that the Messenger of Allah is amongst you. We Muslims who take pride and honor in following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Let us pay attention to this verse because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a reference to Fusuq. لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِدْتُمْ if the Prophet wants to obey people and their suggestions and their desires and their wants, we would all suffer. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made faith desirable in the hearts of the believers. He's adorned it in your hearts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the hearts of the sound person, the believer, the one who's true to his fitra. Allah has made us repel from three, from disbelief, from fusuq, and from disobedience. So what is this fusuq? If we examine the Holy Quran, we find that fusuq is that path of corruption, that path of indecency, that takes you away from justice, from righteousness, from having a harmonious society. And so we have the words fisq and fusuq, both are nouns, gerunds, masdar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to stay away from having the quality of fisq or being a fasiq. Now one may wonder, what prime example does the Holy Quran give us when it comes to being a fasiq and avoiding being a person of corruption. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifully in Surah Al-Hujurat tells us how to avoid being a fasiq. And when we examine this verse, we discover the root cause of racism. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now speaks to the believers. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. La yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asa an yakunu khayran minhum. No group of people should mock others, another group of people. Maybe that other group that you're mocking, you're belittling, you're showing them hatred and bigotry, they could be better than you in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They can be more decent people. Subhanallah, when you examine this verse, you find that the root cause of racism is this feeling of superiority that I am better than others. I can belittle others and I can get away with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits us from engaging in this type of mentality and behavior. And then Allah addresses women. And no group of women should mock any group of women. They could be better than them. Do not use nicknames that are derogatory. Do not slander each other. Then here is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions al-fusuq. How miserable and wretched and unfortunate it is after seeing the light of faith and after seeing the truth that you engage in such behavior. The behavior of those who are corrupt or you yourself become corrupt and engage in such behavior. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in this beautiful verse brings our attention to the root cause of racism. That's when you feel superior, you can say whatever you want, and you feel that others are not going to stop you. You have this feeling of entitlement. Yes, because I feel another group, another race, another ethnicity is inferior, I can get away with it. I'm entitled. In the name of free speech, I can say whatever I want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is a wretched path if you seek this path. Now, one fundamental point that I would like to share with you in our discussion this evening is that today we live in an individualistic society where many people have this none of my business attitude. I know many people themselves, they're decent. Sometimes you're sitting amongst your family. You're not a racist person. You're not a person who approves corruption or fusuk. But when others around you engage in this type of behavior, you really don't care. You don't step in. It's not my business. Why should I get involved? Is this a mentality that the Holy Quran approves of? In one beautiful hadith, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam gives us a very beautiful example. He says, imagine you're on board a ship. There's an upper deck and a lower deck. Now the guys on the upper deck they're looking at the lower deck and they see a group of those people on board the ship coming up with a plan to drown their part, their deck. Let's drill a hole, for example, in our deck and, and basically drown the ship. This is our territory. This is our area. What will the people on the upper deck do? Will they say, yes, it's none of my business, by all means. You'd like to wreck your deck? Do it. Absolutely not. The Prophet says those people in the upper deck, they have to stop those in the lower deck because if their deck drowns, the whole ship drowns. We're all in one ship. So this idea that this is not my concern, it's none of my business. No, it is your business. You're impacted. Your family's impacted. Everyone in society is impacted. If they drown their part of the ship, the whole ship collapses. The entire of society collapses. And, and you know, today with COVID-19, we see this very clearly. Imagine someone's reckless with COVID-19. He says, you know what? I don't believe in this. This is a hoax. Or I feel I have an immunity. Let me go out there. I don't need to wear the mask. It's none of your business. Would you accept that from them? No, because you realize this virus poses a danger. In fact, every other day we hear of an airline coming uh, down in an emergency landing because someone's not wearing a mask. See, we recognize that this virus is a threat. My dear brothers and sisters, the virus of fusuk or the other terms that have been discussed, jahiliya, asabiya, is a serious virus. Don't say it's none of my business. Do something. If your brother, it could be a family member, a friend, you see them engaging in hatred, uh, in, in a type of mentality that 
puts down other people. Step in using an appropriate approach. Do something about it. When we do that, all of society will be saved. Otherwise, look at what's happening in our societies. Today, all types of immoralities are surfacing. Immoral lifestyles are surfacing. And the attitude of many of our youth is, it's not of my business. Remember, we're all on the same ship. If you want to save the ship, you have to be a source of guidance for others. And show them the path of righteousness and stop them from the path of destruction. So this is just a, a brief um, overview of the word fusuq that we find in the Holy Quran and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recommended us to stay from any indecent quality that brings us down and from engaging in any type of behavior that puts down others. Wallah, Imam, excellent. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khayr. And, um, you know, Imam Qazwini, one of the things that, uh, I, I love that uh, narration, by the way. I, I just was uh, mentioning that uh, narration. narration about being engaged yes. in, in society. Yeah. And one of the uh, interesting things about that narration is that the guy that was trying to scuttle the boat, put the hole in the bottom of the boat, he thought he had a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was he was gonna get water. You know, they were tired of inconveniencing the people on the upper deck to get water. So he said, I have a good idea. I'll just get this ax and start chopping a hole in the bottom and we'll get all the water we want. Yeah, you know? like and, compound ignorance. It, it's subhanAllah. See, this is a khayra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you're saying and what Imam Dawah is saying, meshing uh, with Imam Salim, alhamdulillah. This is, this is, this is the mercy of Allah, Azza wa Jal. So what we want to do now, we want to show a video because uh, now we've led with the religious and the spiritual recommendation of how we should approach racism. And many of you viewers and many of our uh, shayu here, we've been talking about this, you've heard these lectures, but what about scientifically, right? So sometimes people need to see, you know, people have different types of uh, personalities. Some people lean more heavily towards science, some people lean more heavily towards spirituality or religion. And uh, Albert Einstein said, by the way, Albert Einstein says that, he said that science without religion is flawed and religion without science is blind. So um, we want to go ahead and show a video here. I think now, is Zach manning this or do I have permission to share, Imam? Because I've been sending Zach some messages in the private chat. Imam Ismadi, yes, can I share sir. my screen? So uh, who's, who's, who's sharing? Okay. I know I can share a screen. If you press share screen, will it come up? Well, do you have the link? I sent Zach the link. You sent the link. Let, let, me, let me see. Let me see. So if I have permission to share, we'll see. I sent the link to Zach though earlier. And the video is short for our viewers. Can you share on the group chat, please? It's only three minutes. Yeah, on the private. If you share it with me, inshallah, we'll, uh, I'll share it on the screen. Okay, so where where am I? You're talking to me, ma'am. It looks like we all know this technology. I'm so behind, so. Mikhail, <laughs> if we don't get the science part, is religion gonna stay blind to that? <laughs> we we got, we got to get the science now. So uh, the link, uh, let me see. I'll send you the link again, Shaq. You can send it to the group chat, inshallah. The one it's, the it's in the, do you have the program in front of you? It's uh, in the program. Okay, inshallah. If you can send the link to the private chat, that would make it easier, inshallah. Okay. Yeah, Allah, mashallah. Okay, let's see where we're at. Let me see if I can share my screen. I think I can share. Yeah, I can share. There we go, it's easier. Let's do it like this. All right, so my screen is going, good. 
I think you know exactly what race you are. But how would you prove it if someone disagreed with you? The fact is, even though race drives a lot of social and political outcomes, race isn't real. One of the first people to attempt to categorize humans according to race was a German scientist around 1776. He came up with five different groups according to physical appearance and geographic origin of their ancestors. Americans of European descent eagerly bought into this type of thinking around the same time. Some historians have said the idea that there were different races helped them resolve the contradiction between a natural right to freedom and the fact of slavery. If whites were their own distinct category, then they could feel a lot better about denying freedom to people who they labeled black and decided were fundamentally different. But as political priorities change, definitions of race in America adjust right along with them. For example, if you were of Mexican birth or ancestry in the United States in 1929, you were considered white. Then the 1930 census changed that to non-white to limit immigration. Later, when the U.S. needed to increase its labor force during World War II, these people were switched back to white. And what it took to be black once varied so wildly throughout the country, from one quarter to one sixteenth to the infamous one drop of African ancestry, that people could actually change races just by crossing state lines. Then suddenly in 2000, the government decided that Americans could be more than one race and added a multiracial category to the census. This has left many Americans scratching their heads when it comes to selecting who they are. As many as 6.2% of census respondents selected some other race in a 2010 survey. The idea that someone might look one way and identify another way, or that they might be really hard to place in a racial category is not new. This is why there was a public debate about whether MSNBC's Karen Finney could say she was black, or how we can't even agree on the racial label assigned to the President of the United States. Of course, many people feel their racial identity is very clear and very permanent, but the fact that some people have changed theirs and that no one can really argue with them shows how shaky the very idea of race is. This is all because there isn't a race chromosome in our DNA that people can point to. It simply doesn't exist. When the medical community links race to health outcomes, it's really just using race as a substitute for other factors, such as where your ancestors came from or the experiences of people who may have been put in the same racial group as you. Dorothy Roberts explains that sickle cell anemia is a prime example of this. The disease is linked to areas with high rates of malaria, which includes some parts of Europe and Asia in addition to Africa. It's not actually about race at all. This, of course, does not mean that the concept of race isn't hugely important in our lives. The racial categories to which we're assigned can determine real life experiences, they can drive political outcomes, and they can even make the difference between life and death. But understanding that racial categories are made up can give us an important perspective on where racism came from in the first place. So alhamdulillah, hopefully our viewers saw that there is even no scientific um, proof for what we call race here in America. And I'm glad that the video gave you some historic context. And now you can see how racism is being used to actually create a caste system in America. And it always has been used in that way because of, of course, the problematic history of chattel slavery. So as Muslims, as all of our imams, our shayukh just explained, as Muslims, it is sacrilegious. It is a sin to uphold these racist ideas and actually to oppress and inflict harm on others, especially those who are already marginalized and oppressed. So we do have a, a couple more minutes. We want to open the floor up for questions. So in the comments section, our imams, our scholars, you can see the questions here. Um, if Zach or our moderator can put the questions up on the screen also, everyone will be able to see the question. So now I will uh, yield here to our audience and the viewers, our jama'ah, our communities, the believing men and women, ladies and gentlemen, please, if you have any questions for any of our imams, you can ask those questions now. Thank you, host. Would you please uh, moderate the questions? Uh, put them up on the screen. Inshallah, I'm gonna look for the questions, inshallah. Okay, Imam Masrati, you're working the controls, huh? <laughs> We're trying, Imam, we're trying. 
Uh, okay, I hope, I hope you out. I'm looking in the comments also. Inshallah. I can I can ask a question to the imams if you don't mind. Please, alhamdulillah. Why is it? And why is it so difficult to overcome this particular sin? It's like even though this is a kabira, this is a major sin. And and the Prophet wasallam addressed it from the beginning, Kullukum li Adam, everyone is from Adam and he would teach his ummah. Why is it so difficult to, to just overcome this sin where our communities continue to drown in committing such acts? I'll chip on it a little bit because it is, for one, we know it's zulm, right? It's zulm. It is oppression, and we know that oppression will be darkness. And the worst oppression, though, is the oppression to one's own soul. So what happens is, through what Imam Dao was mentioning about, he, I think Imam did mention kibber, and that is a big point of it because, of course, all of us like to quote and say the first racist was uh, Iblis, you know, Allah Alam. I mean, he was a whole different species, right? He, he wasn't uh, a man at all. But what we did see from that narration, Allah Aziz wa showed us how he is allowing a creature he created to even rationalize how he is better when Allah Aziz wa created them both. So it's a big lie to ourselves. It's loving ourselves more than what we really are. Actually, it is saying that Allah made a mistake. So, you know, we really have to, it's, so a lot of it is rooted in kibber and a love of self. So that's why it's so hard to root out, in my opinion, Iman, because we think we're all that, right? So if I'm all that, you know, then I can't be wrong, you know. <laughs> you, you know, sometimes it's like that. Can, can I take a shot at it? Please. <laughs> I, I believe one reason why we really struggle with this sin, even though we know it's a heinous crime from the Quranic perspective, it's rooted in selfishness, I believe. Human beings, you know, naturally feel selfish. They want the privileges to themselves. It seems that if we treat others equally or we see them equally, we think that we have to now share resources with them. Now we have to share our privileges with them. So one way to keep what you have, whether it's power, whether it's resources, is just to dismiss other people and render them less than you. That way you're able to justify why you should keep your privileges. So I think there's this built-in fear that we have. You know, We don't want to share with other people. We want to always... Um, have that privilege. Today with white supremacy, we see that. There are many people in this country, they know right from wrong. Believe me, it's not about compound ignorance even for them. They know that they're wrong. But their concern is if I admit to equality and welcome other races, then I have to share resources with them. I don't. Mm -hmm. I want to keep it to myself. I think it's fueled by selfishness and that's why it's so difficult to overcome it. Excellent. Imam Dao, you want to answer that before we get to uh, Khalil Mokminu's question? Yeah, I agree uh, about the the arrogance and also the uh, selfishness. And if I can add on another spiritual mm. disease, and, and, and this goes to the crux of the matter, which you talked about, that really there are no social political solutions to erode racism in of themselves without mm. spiritual remedies for human souls. And this is part of why we as Muslims, we cannot simply focus on secular frameworks of organizing if we're gonna deal with the issue of racism, especially in the Muslim community. But the third disease is mm -hmm. <clears throat> al hasid that forms racism, which is related mm. to this arrogance and selfishness. Uh, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, who's one of the, he's one of the uh, teachers of Imam Shafi. He mentioned that the, the first dhumb in as sama in the heaven, was al-hasid. Why? Because Iblis was envious of Adam, alayhi salam, and 
this enviness or jealousy, El Hasid, isn't just simply I want what you want. It means I mm -hmm. want you want and I want you and to you, lose what you don't you deserve have. it. And you don't so deserve it. Hence, either. You, don't, you don't deserve it. So for instance, the issue of Black Wall Street that many Americans didn't know about but learned about this year that took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, is a group of po prosperous African Americans during the time in, in the 1920s. And there were poor white people that said, look at these black people. They shouldn't be living so good. They're living better than us. So what they do, they burn down the black people. They didn't want them to have it. Even if they couldn't have it, their hassid didn't want them to have it. And so this, this spiritual disease underlies racism. So if we're not dealing with spiritual remedies for the human soul, mm. dealing with this kibber and this selfishness and this envy, uh, we can't march away or legislate away uh, uh, racism. Um, uh, um, I mean, we, we need to organize and politic, mm -hmm. but absolutely. But but it is to say that that's yeah, not dealing with the root. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Imam, Wallahi, you know, Subhanahu. I'm so grateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for you all, your scholarship and your take on this because Wallahi, this is I see, in my opinion, the Khaira of Allah. There's so many dimensions. Like you, you just mentioned, Hasid. Wallahi, that is something that that we get confused. You know, jealousy is a human emotion, right? And jealousy is just, hey, I want something someone else has. It's not laudable. You know, it's it's ugly. But it's not sin worthy until it activates what you said, Iman. Envy. Envy is like, I want what you have, you don't deserve it, and I start to hate you and resent you and have contempt for you because of what you have. SubhanAllah. I think that is a very good analysis, Iman Daoud, of uh, the American race, racism problem that we're going through. Imam Salim, uh, welcome back. We do have a question from um, our beloved, uh, Khalil Mukminu. And uh, I'm going to read the question. Imam Ismail, maybe you can put it on the screen and we'll let Imam Salim get first crack at it since he's just joining us again. And then we also want to be aware of time. It's, at eight, it's 840 now. So I guess we can start wrapping up towards uh, 9 o'clock uh, if that's okay with you all. Um, does Islam allow people to abduct free persons and essentially force them into an enslaved status? Or is enslavement only rightfully imposed on populations of people who were at war with the Islamic State. And uh, we're going to defer to Imam Salim first, but I'm sure some more of you might have some uh, knowledge on that. Can you hear me now, Imam? Got you. Sir. Got you. Alhamdulillah. Uh, and I almost have to see the question again. Um, Imam Smarty, can you put? Does uh, post the Islam allow the enslavement of Thank people you. to abduct free people and essentially force them into an enslaved status? Or is enslavement only rightfully imposed on populations of people who were at war with the Islamic state? Okay, I don't know if he's talking about a particular situation today. Uh, or just in general. Uh, and I mean, obviously, and I'll take first crack at this, maybe this will start a conversation. Uh, Islam uh, does not uh, allow for that in terms of just general conduct of people. The unlawful enslavement of people, of course, Islam does not allow for that. I think that's the easiest way to respond to it. If others would like to jump in, they're welcome to do that. Imam Qazwini, can you, can you address that and then we'll just take it around? Yes, our scholarly understanding is that if there is a group of people, community, they have a country, they have a village, they're living peacefully and they are free people, we cannot just go wage war against them and enslave them. Islam does not recognize uh, this type of enslavement. So what the white settlers did in the, in the Americas by just you know, going to, let's say, whether it was Haiti in the Caribbean or to Western Africa and just enslave peaceful people, this is not something that Islam recognizes at all. Yes, there are certain situations if a group of people are at war, 
They're mobilizing. They're spreading hatred. And they are actively seeking war with the Muslim community. Then the Holy Quran does talk about the rule of engagement during those times. And that, yes, you know, if they come to attack the Muslims or they're mobilizing against the Muslim community and the Muslims achieve victory, then, you know, in certain cases, they can enslave them. Uh, even though many times the Prophet wasallam would, you know, offer them a way uh, to liberty, uh, to, you know, to free those captives. But people who are just peaceful, living in their living, and then suddenly they're sad and they are abducted. No, this is not something that our pure religion recognizes at all. Hmm. Then it's interesting, uh, both Imam Salim and Imam Kazwini uh, brought this perspective. And it's a great question, by the way, Khalil, because actually, in most instances, imprisonment or captivity it is a, it ends up as being like slavery, you know, even that's, that's constituted in the United States Constitution right now with the 13th Amendment. Uh, Imam Dawood, I know you have something to say on that. Um, obviously, this isn't an issue that affects us directly in the continental United States of America, but we've seen news reports in the last couple of years about Libya and mm -hmm. people being enslaved in Libya. And we need to be very clear that amongst the Madhahib, it is totally haram and forbidden for a, for a Muslim to go and enslave a free Muslim or mm -hmm. enslave their Muslim brother or sister, which is still going on to this day. And it has gone on, unfortunately, in some times in Islamic history, but just because it was done by certain people under certain governments does it mean that it was acceptable according to sharia and i'll give you an example we mentioned it last night but muhammad uh, ibn saeed who later mm -hmm. came to detroit was known as nicholas saeed mm -hmm. he was a, <laughs> he was a free muslim west african he was enslaved by the turks during the ottoman rule adult osmania his own muslim brother enslaved him and then sold him off to the Russians, and then eventually he was sold off and was brought to America. So you had a Muslim brother was enslaved by his own Muslim brothers, sold off to disbelievers, and then brought to America to be a slave. That's totally haram, totally un-Islamic, and unfortunately in Islamic history, or not Islamic history, it's Islamic in Muslim history, we have stories like this in Turkey and Morocco where these things were sanctioned by the Sultan. So uh, it, it's, but it's totally un-Islamic. The Maliki say it's un-Islamic and the the, the, the Shafi'is, the Hanafis, the, the Ibadis, the Zaydis, the, the uh, Ibn Ashiris, Kulluhum, all of the Madhab say this is this is haram. Mm -hmm. Um, recently, my so my grandparents are are from Iraq, and recently, the past few years, I'm sure you all heard about the controversy of ISIS enslaving some of those Yazidis. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know they were uh, peacefully living in Iraq. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi made room for the Yazidis for non-Muslims who are living under the protection of the Muslim state. The Prophet said, "If you harass them, it's as if you've harassed me." Yes, so, sir. That gave a very negative image of Islam in the media, unfortunately. But no, what they did, what those thugs did by just going, attacking those villages and enslaving their women or their people is not something that Islam recognizes. And not any of them that I have sat in that. And, and I'm really glad that you mentioned those minority groups, Imam Fazwini, because that's another form of oppression. You know, when the people in the majority you know, don't look out for those that might not have as much say so in, in inclusion. Imam Dao, you also touched on something that we were dealing with. You know, uh, I wrote about it in my book, and um, actually, you addressed it uh, a little in your book about the centering blackness, but I was addressing uh, uh, Malikat Yaminuk. And I remember we were in an Imam's meeting one time, and I told the Imams about this that was creeping up in the hood, you know, in a lot of times, <laughs> but actually not just in the hood, but even among younger Muslims of many different ethnicities, thinking that they could declare uh, their personal jihad, you know, a uh, uh, theoretical jihad on society and, and take a young woman, 
you know, that they like and claim her as Malikati Aminu. <laughs> I mean, we laugh so we don't cry, you know, but we, we do uh, ask Allah to guide us all and guide them. But that's why these platforms are great to have all this diversity of scholarship and to address our community. I want to read this question here. To say oh, from, ready, Please. From, from a fifth piece standpoint. Yes. Um, so number one, it's considered a major sin to enslave a free person. It's min al-kabail. So this is not a minor sin. It's a major sin. Uh, number two, slavery is not allowed in Islam. Islam never introduced slavery. Islam um, came in a time where slavery was prominent. It was all over the world. And it allowed us to get rid of it through stages. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the greatest model for that. So to come a time where slavery is justified in any country around the world is muharram. Because Islam never introduced it. Islam was never okay with it. But Islam was addressing it uh, in different stages. Regulating. Um, so even from a fiqhi standpoint, this doesn't... I know many people... Uh, that attack Islam and and mm. falsely claim that Islam agrees with this. It, from a fiqhi standpoint, it doesn't stand at all, and it is it's not allowed. Even Malikat Yamino or that with your uh, hand possessed, all of that does not exist in in, in, in Sharia ah, because he never introduced it. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Alhamdulillah, wa sallam. I'm glad that Imam Musmari mentioned that. So for all of our viewers, there's no such thing as dating a woman and calling her your right hand possession. Even Imam Daud mentioned that. It's super duper haram to enslave a Muslim. You can't enslave a non-combatant. You can't enslave a free person. But then it's super duper haram. It's unheard of to just enslave a Muslim. So yeah, thank you. That's right. Yeah, you can't. You can't go to the hookah lounge or a club and find a non-Muslim woman and say she's milka yami. I over you. That. So you have to cut that out if you're doing that. Because we need to feel that. It's the sin of zina, and the sin of lying. That's both. Ya Allah. And and, and so he is like. He, He's basically messed up. He's yeah. I really appreciate you, you all, Wallahi, for addressing this. This is Khaira, inshallah. So let's go ahead and read the question we have from a convert. And uh, Imam, if you can put this up, Facebook user. Uh, Facebook user says, it is really complex to navigate race as a white convert Muslim. Sometimes, what would your recommendations be to someone who is walking into the ummah with all of the baggage of U.S. society, and then having to unpack privileges and our place in the Ummah without displacing people or accidentally bringing white supremacist ideas into the room? Great question. You remember, Smarty? I just finished. <laughs> God. Oh, I'm getting you. To, I'm getting you to rock again, brother. You hot? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, please, please go ahead. This question has a lot of. Uh, we have to read it a few times. So please go Imam, ahead. Imam Salim, can you start us up? Yeah, Bismillah. I mean, it's it's like anything that we do in life. Uh, part of our, um, I, I think, part of the human quality is this capacity to start to feel out a situation. So when you're transitioning into anything, uh, part of that is the patience of being quiet, mm. coming into a new circle mm. and beginning to explore through listening and understanding this new environment. And that, that's whether or not you're white, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're African-American, this transition from this world and all it contains into Islam is a gradual mm. process. I mean, we don't, you know, who walks into to any situation brand new and goes to the head of the class and starts either conducting the class or feeling as if they understand what's going on? You come in the door, you have patience, you, you listen, you try to understand what's taking place at the same time you're living and learning. So mm. a lot of patience, a lot of humility, uh, and a lot of uh, understanding and attempt to understand. We all got baggage now, talking about baggage. And baggage doesn't disappear. The other thing about baggage is it doesn't disappear overnight, especially in an environment like this. It mm -hmm. takes a whole lot of work. Mm. 
Excellent. And, and ma'am, I'm glad you said that we all have baggage because even I was narrating this to some of the youth groups and it, I was laughing. I was saying how the Prophet Sallallahu would sit with his uh, companions and they would begin to remember the things they did in Jahiliya, Al Jahiliya, when they were ignorant before Islam. And they would laugh at themselves. They would, remember what Umar did, right? Umar was like, I was crazy. I ate my God. You know, he laughed because <laughs> it was, he was worshiping his idol before Islam and he was holding it into a, a idol and then he ate it. So uh, can any one of you elaborate more on that question for our uh, convert brother or sister here? I think one very important point that is helpful in getting rid of uh, this baggage is to remember that the Lord that you worship and you claim to love created all these different people. That's the work of Allah. And it's a sign of Allah. Celebrate that. Cherish that. In Allah Surah Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, wa min ayati, amongst his very important signs, khalqu samawati wal ard, the creation of the universe. Now that's big. Right after the universe, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Khilafu al sinatikum wa alwanikum. And the diversity of your languages, your colors, that's the artwork of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person deeply loves their artwork, and that is the artwork of the Almighty God. I think just remembering that uh, significantly helps uh, in getting rid of this baggage. And this sheds light on why you know racism can lead to this move because racism at its core it means I have a problem with what God did, I have a problem with his creation and how he set up his creation and how he formed his creation. Now, how can I stand before God and worship him when I have hatred towards what he's done? That does not add up. I think just keeping that in mind significantly should help with um, getting rid of these bad things. I mean, Imam Yeah, I have a couple more points. Um, I miss with Imam Salim. Uh, said about Oscar Bia, and he, he probably had mentioned this, but if he didn't, I'm going to reiterate something that when the Sahaba asked, uh, when they said, Ya Rasulullah, Ma al Asbiya, or Mel Asbiya, what's Asbiya? And he responded, And to Ainuka Komaka al Zul, is to help your people in wrongdoing, right? So he didn't say asabia was that you have a type of positive relationship or that you have a connection with your people. So there is no need to do tabarra or disassociate yourself from being white to be a Muslim. And mm -hmm. I have to say that. And also mm -hmm. for people who are not um, who are not white who are watching, especially most younger people, we have to be very careful that we don't turn anti-white supremacy into being anti-white people. I see this coming up in a lot of young Muslims and uh, university level and a lot of young activists that their, their critiques and their conversations gone beyond just being anti-white supremacy. It's literally gone to being anti-white people. And we know that the Prophet said, alayhi salam, in the farewell sermon, the black doesn't have virtue over the ahmar, over the white, nor does the white have virtue over the black. So there's nothing uh, intrinsically meritorious about you being non-white and then being anti-white people. You can be anti-white supremacy, but not anti-white people. And we have to be really clear about it. And that was the message of Malcolm X when he came out from Hajj, by the way. He wasn't anti-white people when he came out from Hajj. He was anti-white supremacy. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm really glad, uh, Imam, alhamdulillah, all the work that you're doing, and you mentioned that because um, remember, white supremacy is a tyrannical institution. And it's an, an objective, actually, it's one of the, the mandates that the Muslim fights against that and establishes justice where Allah uh, uh, says, Inna Allah bil right? Uh, we are commanded uh, to justice. So these are some of the same things that our viewers are hearing from the Mimbar and from great lectures on Fridays from Unity Center, from you all, uh, all the time. 
But I'm really grateful to Allah Azzawajal that we could get everyone on this platform and address all of our community simultaneously. Alhamdulillah, it is uh, 8.57. So what uh, we will do now is we will yield the floor to you all to give some closing remarks. I don't see any more questions. Imam Ismail, you can help me with that. If you all feel like answering uh, some more questions, if they come up, we can do that. Or we can go out with closing remarks and then I'll wrap up. Well, actually, Imam Masmari is doing the wrap up. <laughs> I think closing remarks is good. So we can. Okay. Okay. So, and, um, and let, let me just read a little of your bios, too, because I didn't do that at the beginning. I know you all are shy and modest, but I'm going to read a little bit because it's, uh, uh, Alhamdulillah, I appreciate you. Uh, Imam Daoud, of course, is uh, currently the executive director of, Mich of the Michigan chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations. We always say care, but sometimes, Imam Dao, we gotta let people know what care means, right? The Council on American Islamic Relations. He's senior fellow at Auburn Seminary based in New York. He's the author of the book, Towards Sacred Activism, co-author of the books, Centering Black Narratives, Black Muslim Nobles, Among the Early Pious Muslims and Centering Black Narratives, Ahlul Bayt. Uh, did that come out yet? That, yeah, Ahlul Bayt, uh, Blackness in Africa, and author essays in uh, 2012 book, uh, All American, 45 American Men on Being Muslim, as well as the 2014 book, Quran and Conversation. Alhamdulillah, Imam Bakr Qazwini, Alhamdulillah, very famous name, uh, Saeed Muhammad Bakr Qazwini has a BA in sociology from U of M, Go Blue, and Auburn. He studied at the Seminary of Home. Currently, he is an assistant imam at the Islamic Institute of America in Dearborn Heights. He is also the director of Al Hujja uh, Islamic Seminary. And Am I tired? I'm scared of the word famous. It could lead me to Jahidullah. <laughs> well, let's say honorable. Alhamdulillah. Uh, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So, um, and of course, I don't have a bio for Imam Salim, but Imam Salim is our elder. Imam Salim was uh, the imam of one of the most famous and pillared uh, uh, masjids in Detroit. Uh, was it was that Masjid Mu'min, Imam Salim? Masjid Mu'minin. Masjid Mu'minin that gave a lot of uh, the, the brothers that became our teachers our start, uh, particularly uh, Imam Luqman, rahimahullah, uh, one of my teachers, my first teacher and my imam. So we do thank Imam Salim and all the contributions he's done. He's worked in finance. He's worked in marketing, uh, Islamic community, building Islamic organizations all around the world. And we have been blessed to keep him stateside for the last 10 years. Yeah, we kept you? Yeah, it has been 10 years. Uh -huh. Alhamdulillah. You must love us. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Sheikh. So, uh, please forgive me if I left out anything. Of course, I, I asked our shayukh for small bios. Uh, and Imam Ismadi, of course, needs no great introduction. Imam Ismadi has uh, studied uh, more than half his life, almost. Uh, you know, more than half of his life uh, in, in Yemen and uh, abroad. He's uh, studied and taken to memory. Um, I don't want to embarrass him, but he's taken to memory a lot. Uh, and we all know who he is. He's very modest, and he won't allow me to to brag about him too much. But uh, Imam Ismadi is the Imam, and and resident Imam and scholar of the Muslim Unity Center in West Bloomfield, Michigan. And he's also a very uh, involved community person. He is the the chairperson of the Imams Council of Michigan. And uh, we love you very much, all of you. Thank you very much. I think we have more questions. No, we don't. It is nine o'clock. So with that, Imam Asmari, I'm going to yield to you for our wrap up, two to three minute wrap up. And then we'll have closing dua from our Imam Bakar Kazmi. To be honest, it's talking in the presence of all of you is so difficult because I just want to see you all and talk to you. And Allah is my witness. You know, talking about this topic, I think we can go on and on and on. There's one hadith that I that I can mention, inshallah, conclude with, is when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam noticed that a man came into the masjid and prayed in the corner by himself. And after he completed his salah, he came up to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, 
And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Salli fa innaka lam tusall." Pray for your prayer was not accepted. And he prays again, and he prays a third time, not knowing the the purpose behind this rejection. Why isn't his salah accepted? And subhanallah, to find out by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he prayed alone. Uh, he chose a uh, a place in the masjid where no one was there. He didn't feel comfortable to stand shoulder to shoulder to hit next to his brothers. Uh, he couldn't humble himself in the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which led to the rejection of that prayer. So we're talking about a, a, a great sin here. Allow us to be embracive. Allow us to be welcoming. And Subhan Imam al muhasibi alayhi rahmatullah says something very interesting. He says, if you... When striving towards reaching this noble object objective, if you realize that there is a lot of struggle in the process, then know that you're struggling with an illness. Because sometimes we praise ourselves, Alhamdulillah, I'm overcoming this. He says, just by saying that, know that you're drowning in that illness. So, and this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam لم يتكلف التواضع He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never... Um, was never overwhelmed with humbleness mm -hmm. or being embraced. This is this is who the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was. He never embraced Bilal because Bilal was Abyssinian. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just okay. I have to humble myself. He loved Bilal because Bilal was Bilal. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel that this is how we need to look at our community members. Is that the idea that we're still struggling with this? Is that we have not worked on our iman and addressed. These uh, these issues that that truly take over the heart and then destroy one's one's connection with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Zakumullah khair, our dear Imams. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I've learned a lot, and hopefully we continue to learn from each other. I love you all for the sake of Allah. Zakumullah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Once again, thank you all, and we will end with the closing du'a from Imam Hazwini. Ahsantum, barakallahu bikum. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد I am infinitely thankful to the Almighty Allah for bringing us this evening together. And we as Imams on this panel, we come from so many different backgrounds. And this should be an example for us, for our communities to come together, to embrace one another. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this evening to heal our hearts from arrogance, from ignorance, from jealousy, from hatred, from racism, through his holy book, through the holy Quran, through the example of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and his family, the Ahlul Bayt, and his righteous companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal these hearts from these spiritual illnesses, to bring us closer to one another, and to prevent us from dehumanizing one another, to always see the humanity in one another. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower you with his rahmah, with his blessings, and with his protection. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ameen. Wa alaykum wa salamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you all for tuning in. Jazakum al-khayyah.